End of topicals. We're now going to start with the Prime Minister's questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we have question one from current Gareth Davies. Gareth Davies. Number one, please, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Gareth Davies. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by congratulating the Prime Minister on his one-year anniversary yeah. as Conservative yeah. Party leader? Yeah. As we look at our long-term economic recovery, can the Prime Minister assure me that Lincolnshire will receive the required funding to boost digital connectivity for all the people of Grantham, Stamford, Bourne and our local villages? Yes, Mr Speaker, indeed I can, and that's why we've not only pledged £5 billion in funding for gigabit capable broadband to across the country, including the hardest to reach areas, but in addition a £34 million package uh, of Lincolnshire for Lincolnshire Superfast Broadband, helping 135,000 households uh, to benefit from gigabit capable speeds. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, the Right Honourable Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by welcoming reports this week of significant progress in the vaccine trials in Oxford? We all know there's a long way to go, but I want to record my thanks and admiration for everybody involved in this huge effort. Mr Speaker, under my leadership, national security will always be the top priority for Labour. So I want to ask the Prime Minister about the extremely serious report by the Intelligence and Security uh, Committee. It concludes that Russia poses an immediate and urgent threat to our national security and is engaged in a range of activities that include espionage, interfering in democratic processes and serious crime. The Prime Minister received that report ten months ago. Given that the threat is described as immediate and urgent, why on earth did the Prime Minister sit on that report for so long? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, actually, when I was uh, Foreign Secretary and for the period that I've been in office, we've been taking the strongest possible action against Russian uh, wrongdoing, orchestrating, I seem to remember, the expulsion of 130 Russian diplomats, 153 Russian diplomats around the world, while the right honourable gentleman opposite sat on his hands and said nothing while the Labour Party parroted the line of the Kremlin when people in this country were poisoned at the orders of the Vladimir. Putin. Mr Speaker, I stood up and condemned what happened in Salisbury and, uh, uh, and the Prime Minister, I supported the then Prime Minister on record. So I'd ask the Prime Minister to check the record and withdraw that. I was very, very clear. The report was very clear that until recently the government badly underestimated the Russian threat and the response it required. It's still playing catch-up. The government's taken its eye off the ball. Arguably, it wasn't even on the pitch. After this government's been in power for 10 years, how does the Prime Minister explain that? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I really do, I think the uh, right honourable gentleman's questions are absolutely absurd. There is no country in the Western world that is more vigilant in protecting the interests of this country or the international community from Russian interference. And in fact, we are going further now, introducing new legislation to protect critical national infrastructure and uh, to protect our intellectual property. And uh, I think he will find, if he goes to any international body or any uh, gathering uh, around the world, that it is the UK that leads the world in caution about Russian interference. And I must say, I don't wish to contradict the right honourable gentleman, but he sat on his hands, he said nothing. The leader of the opposition, the leader of the opposition, parroted the line of the Kremlin uh, that the UK should supply... I didn't hear him criticise the the then leader of the opposition. If he he criticised the then leader of the opposition, then now is the time for him to set the record straight. Mr Speaker, I was absolutely clear in condemning what happened in Salisbury, not least, not least because I was involved in bringing proceedings against Russia on behalf of the Litvinenko family. That is why I was so strong about it. Um, and Mr Speaker, I spent five years as Director of Public Prosecutions working on live operations with the Security and Intelligence Services, so I'm not going to take lectures from the Prime Minister about national security. The Prime Minister... Oh! I think somebody wants to go for a cup of tea. We don't want an early bath, Prime Minister. 
Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister says he will bring forward new legislation. I want to make it clear to the Prime Minister we will support that legislation and work with the Government. It is not before time. Eighteen months ago, the Prime Minister says the Government is vigilant. Eighteen months ago, the Home Secretary said we do not have all the powers yet to tackle the Russian threat. And he said the Official Secrets Act are completely out of date. Other legislation has been passed in that 18-month period. This is about national security. Why has the government delayed so long in bringing forward this legislation? Mr Speaker, this government is bringing forward legislation, not only a new espionage act, not only new uh, laws to protect against uh, theft of our intellectual property, uh, but also a Magnitsky Act uh, directly uh, to counter individuals in Russia or elsewhere who transgress uh, human rights. And there's been no doubt what this is really all about, Mr Speaker. This is about pressure from the Islingtonian Remainers, uh, who have seized on this, on this report uh, to try to give the impression that the Russia, that Russia Russian interference was somehow responsible for Brexit, Mr Speaker. That's what this is, this is all about. The people of this, this country didn't vote to leave the EU because of pressure from Russia or Russian interference. They voted because they wanted to take back control of our money, of our trade policy, of our laws. And the simple fact is that after campaigning for Remain, after wanting to overturn the people's referendum, uh, day in, day out, all the period in, when he was sitting on the Labour front bench, he simply can't bring himself to accept that. Can I just gently say to the Prime Minister, as I did last time, he may have to go to Specsavers. The tour is this way, not that way. If he can address me, it would be a lot better. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I see the Prime Minister is already on his pre-prepared lines. This is a serious question, a serious question of national security. The Prime Minister sat on this report for 10 months and failed to plug a gap in our law on national security for a year and a half. Mr Speaker, one of the starkest conclusions in the report is that the UK is clearly a target for Russian disinformation campaigns. The report also highlights that this is being met with a fragmented response across Whitehall and across the government. The report refers to this as a hot potato, with no one organisation recognising itself as having the overall lead. That's a serious gap in our defences. This is not about powers, it's about responsibility, Prime Minister. So how is the Prime Minister going to address that gap and make sure the UK meets this threat with the joined-up, robust response it deserves. Uh, Mr Speaker, there is no other government in the world that takes some more robust steps to protect our uh, democracy, to protect our critical national infrastructure and to protect our intellectual property, as I have said, uh, from interference by Russia or by anyone else. And frankly, I think that everybody understands that these criticisms are motivated by a desire to undermine the referendum on the European Union, uh, the membership of the European Union, that took place uh, last, uh, in, in 2016. 2016, at the result of which he simply cannot bring himself to accept. A serious gap in our Official Secrets Act, laying bare for 18 months, and that's all the Prime Minister has to say about it. One way the Government can seek to clamp down on Russian influence is to prevent the spread of Kremlin-backed disinformation. Obviously, social media companies have a big role to play, but the report also highlights serious distortions in the coverage provided by Russian state-owned international broadcasters such as Russia Today. The High Court has ruled that Russia Today broadcasts pose actual and potential harm. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it is time to look again at the licensing for Russia Today to operate in the UK? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I think this would come more credibly uh, from the leader of the opposition had he called out uh, his former, the former leader of the opposition when he took money uh, for appearing on Russia Today. I mean, Mr. Speaker, he protested. Mr. Speaker, he protested neither against the, leader, the, the, the former leader of the opposition's stance on Salisbury nor against uh, his willingness to take money from Russia Today. Uh, he he flip flops from day to day, Mr. Speaker. One day he's in favour of, uh, of staying in the EU, and the next day he's. And the next day he's willing to accept Brexit. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the Leader of the Opposition has more flip-flops than Bournemouth Beach. Oh. <laughs> flip-flops. Alexander Stafford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, the party opposite bravely abstained on a vote that attempted to tie us into the EU indefinitely, further highlighting the increasing detachment of Labour from the old heartlands like Rother Valley. 
Can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, confirm that we on this side of the House remain fully committed to delivering our promises to the British people and are restoring our full economic independence on the 1st of January so the people of Thurcroft, Maltby, Diddington and across the Valley get the Brexit bonanza and level up that we so deserve? Uh, Mr Speaker, I certainly can give my honourable friend uh, that assurance. That's what the people voted for and that's what we will deliver. Bring Keir Starmer back for one more question. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, pre-prepared gags on flip-flops. This is the the former columnist who wrote two versions of every article ever published. (laughs) (laughs) Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, in case the Prime Minister hasn't noticed, the Labour Party is under new management. And no front bencher, no front bencher of this party has appeared on Russia today since I've been leading this party. Finally, Mr Speaker, I want to ask the Prime Minister about the appalling persecution of the Ouija Muslims in China. We've all seen the footage of the Ouijas being herded onto trains and heard the heartbreaking stories of forced sterilisation, murder and imprisonment. We support the Foreign Secretary, the Prime Minister and the Government in their strong and clear condemnation of uh, of China for this in recent weeks. What further steps will the Prime Minister take, and in particular will he consider targeted sanctions against those responsible, and will he lead a a concerted diplomatic action with our international partners to make clear that this simply cannot be allowed to stand in the 21st century? Mr Speaker, that's why, that's why the Foreign Secretary only uh, this week condemned the treatment of the, of the Uyghurs, and that's why this government, for the first time, has brought in targeted sanctions against those who abuse human rights in the form of the Magnitsky Act, and I'm, I'm delighted he now supports the government. But last week, of course, he didn't support the government, Mr Speaker. I'm glad he's with us this week. I don't know how many more questions he's got, Mr Speaker, since you allow him to, to come, back, uh, come back and ask uh, uh, in, in, throughout, this, throughout this session. Uh, we've been getting on uh, consistently with delivering on our agenda. A year ago, Mr Speaker, this was a, this was a leader of the opposition who was supporting an anti-Semitism condoning uh, Labour, a government that wanted to, wanted to, do, wanted to repeal Brexit. Uh, uh, this is a, I represent a government that was getting on with delivering on the people's priorities. 40 new hospitals, uh, Mr Speaker, 20,000 more police, 50,000 more nurses, and by the way, we've already re- recruited 12,000 more nurses and 6,000 uh, more doctors and 4,000 more police. We are delivering on the people's priorities. We are the people's government. And by the way, we're the government that supports the workers of this country as well, with the biggest ever increase in the living wage. We're heading up to Scotland to visit the SNP leader, Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, the Tory party held a political cabinet with the Prime Minister in a panic about the majority and increasing support for Scottish independence. Apparently, Mr Speaker, their great strategy amounts to more UK cabinet ministers coming to Scotland. Can I tell the Prime Minister, the more Scotland sees of this UK government, the more convinced they are the need for Scotland's independence. A far better plan for the Tories would be to listen to the will of the Scottish people. So, before his visit tomorrow, will the Prime Minister call a halt to his government's full frontal attack on devolution. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I really don't know what the right honourable gentleman is talking about. So the, only, the, only, the, only bill I could, the only bill I can think of that's before the House or will be coming before the House and that I know enjoys uh, cross-party support is uh, the UK Internal Market Bill. And Although that is a, a massively devolutionary bill, Mr Speaker, which gives uh, huge powers straight back from, from Brussels uh, to, to, to Scotland, uh, its principal purpose is to protect jobs and protect growth throughout the entire United Kingdom, to stop pointless barriers of trade between all awful parts of our of our country and anybody sensible mr speaker would support it yeah. Yeah. ian blackford anybody sensible mr speaker would realize from that answer that the prime minister simply does not get scotland in 2014 the people of scotland were promised devolution max near federalism the most powerful devolved parliament in the world instead we got a tory trade bill that threatens our NHS, an immigration bill 
that will devastate our economy, a power grab that will dismantle devolution. Scotland's powers grabbed by Westminster, workers' rights attacked, the rape clause in the bedroom tax, our NHS up for sale, the overwhelming majority in Scotland's parliaments, its MPs and its people oppose all these measures. How can the Prime Minister claim that this is a union of equal partners when these damaging policies will all be imposed upon Scotland against its will? Minister. I mean, I, I really hesitate to accuse the right honourable gentleman of failing to listen to my last answer, but it was, it, it's very clear that the UK in, internal market bill is massively devolutionary, uh, Mr Speaker, but that is not its, that its 70 powers uh, passed passed from Brussels uh, to Scotland. And I think I, it's quite incredible. Of course, it's, its purpose is very sensible, which is to protect jobs and growth throughout the entire uh, UK. But it, it, just on a political level, it seems bizarre to me that the Scottish Nationalist Party actually want to reverse that process, hand those powers back to unelected and unaccountable bureaucrats in Brussels. Is that really uh, the policy? I don't think it's sensible. Tom Randall. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the Health Secretary's call for a review into the reporting of coronavirus deaths. I raised this point recently with a national statistician at uh, a PAC uh, Select Committee evidence session, and he said that the numbers themselves would not change the policy, but would my right hand friend agree that the true numbers will help improve confidence in the policy? Mm. And as the Royal College of Pathologists have pointed out, failing to determine the difference between dying of and with COVID-19 is, is key to understanding um, the um, Getting better information and key to understanding this disease. Yeah, yes. uh, my my honourable friend makes an extremely important point, and as I've said repeatedly at this dispatch box, Mr. Speaker, it is very uh, important that we uh, wait until the conclusion of this epidemic and have a proper statistical assessment of uh, of where we are. And that, I think, is the course I would I would recommend to him. Ben Bradshaw. Mr Speaker, I was the first member of this House to raise concerns about Russian interference in our democracy four years ago. By blocking the publication of the Russia report before the election on the grounds that the ISC committee has said were spurious, and then trying to fix the committee, isn't it abundantly clear that this Prime Minister has knowingly and repeatedly put his own personal and party interests before the national security of our country? Uh, uh, no, Mr. Speaker, and I think that's a pretty lamentable way of looking at it, lamentable question, because, uh, I, I, after all, if he thought there was genuinely something uh, in the ISC report that showed that, uh, for instance, the Brexit referendum had been undermined uh, by Russia, then he would now be saying it, but that doesn't appear. And I'm afraid what you have here, as, I, as I'm afraid I've told the, the House several times, is the, the, the rage and fury of the Remainer elite uh, finding that there is in fact nothing in uh, this report and no smoking gun uh, whatever after all that froth and fury and, and suddenly all those who want to remain in the EU find uh, that they have no argument uh, to, to stand on and I, I, I regret that they, they should simply move on. Still. Thank you Mr Speaker. I visited nine schools in Peterborough in recent weeks. Heads, uh, teachers and, of course, support staff are doing brilliant work facilitating e-learning and looking after vulnerable families. But their huge effort is no substitute, substitute for classroom learning. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it's absolutely vital that we get children back where they belong, in the classroom, from September? Yeah. I, I do indeed agree with that, Mr Speaker, and it will be a fantastic thing. Uh, to hear the Labour Party uh, stand up to their friends in the, in the unions and, and issue the same uh, instruction. I think that would be a wonderful thing. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Social Market Foundation report identified Hull as the area facing the worst economic hit and the slowest recovery to COVID-19. Now, I have stood here in this place and called on the government for support for the caravan manufacturing for Hull Trains, The Deep, Hull City Council excluded young entrepreneurs and many others and received an inadequate response from the government that fails to address the gravity of the situation Hull faces. What the Prime Minister needs to recognise is that you cannot level up by shutting down. So what new support will he give to prevent job losses in Hull West and Hesel? Hear, hear. Prime Minister. 
Uh, well, Mr Speaker, we've already given uh, the East Riding uh, of Yorkshire over £21 million to deal with the pressures of coronavirus. We've uh, supported 90% of, of caravan manufacturers uh, who she rightly supports with the, the furlough scheme. And uh, as she knows, we have not only the Kickstarter uh, fund, the £2 billion fi- Kickstarter fund to help uh, young people into work, uh, but also the, the job retention, the furlough uh, bonus scheme to, to retain people in their jobs as part of a massive uh, package, £640 billion overall to get our country moving again and make sure that we bounce back stronger than ever before. A butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, schools in Buckinghamshire have done a tremendous job in recent months balancing online uh, learning with physical classes for the children of key workers. Will my right hon. Friend join me in thanking the teachers of the Aylesbury constituency? And will you also agree with me that it is right to have increased funding for schools, providing more money for all pupils and so giving them the best prospects for their future? Uh, Yes, Mr Speaker, and I am proud that uh, we have uh, fulfilled our promise, our manifesto promise, we're levelling up school funding across the country so that uh, every uh, primary school pupil receives at least £4,000 per head, every secondary school pupil £5,150, and I uh, pay tribute to all the teachers uh, and all the schools in his constituency for the excellent work that they've done in the last few months. Ben Lake. Mr Speaker, face coverings will become mandatory on public transport in Wales next Monday. Now, a zero VAT rating has been applied to most PPE since the 1st of May, but at present it does not apply to non-medical face coverings. Will the Prime Minister therefore extend the zero rating to these items so that members of the public, especially those on low incomes, are not financially penalised for following the rules? Well, well, Mr Speaker, we, 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 as, as, he, as, the right, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, uh, and I thank him very much for his, for his question, uh, we, we have removed uh, VAT from all, uh, from all PPE, uh, including uh, VAT on, on face masks that, uh, as everybody knows, can protect uh, from infection, and that removed the burden of VAT in, in care homes, NHS trusts and, and for key workers. Uh, for, for, for homemade uh, face masks, those which meet the PHE guidance uh, will be covered and will continue to be covered uh, by uh, the zero rate, but I'm happy to ask the relevant minister to, to write to him to, to, to clarify the entire position. Liam Mellon. Friday is the first anniversary of my right hon. Friend becoming Prime Minister, and over the last 12 months, his focus on record funding for the NHS, boosted funding for every school child in, the, in England, and also great progress on recruiting more police officers, has all enabled us to start to address some of the ingrained regional inequalities that we have in our country. Can my right hon. Friend ensure that levelling up remains central to his vision for our country for every single year of his Premiership. I thank my right hon. Friend, and I can absolutely give her that uh, guarantee that, uh, in the current circumstances, uh, now is the time to, to double down on, on levelling up, Mr Speaker, and that's what we're, we're going to do. And That's why we're rolling out a colossal programme of investment in, in infrastructure, uh, massive investments in our, in our public services and fantastic new technology, because that is the way to give every part of our country the opportunity to realise uh, its potential. Robinson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. On the 10th of July, the Prime Minister met Bethany from Crewe during People's Prime Minister's Questions, where she took the opportunity to raise the campaign for the extension of maternity leave as a direct consequence of COVID-19. And during that session, the Prime Minister not only undertook to look at the petition, but understood the significant ramifications lockdown has had on mums and parents who have missed out on childcare support, on health visitor access, on the availability of building bonds with wider family members and the community. Ten days later, can I ask the Prime Minister, has he considered that petition? And with recess fast approaching, can he give an indication as to when the Government will respond to the necessary request to get this precious time back for mothers and families? Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. I, rem- I well remember Bethany and her, and her question, and I know how difficult this uh, problem is for many people, and uh, I can certainly uh, commit to him uh, to look at it in detail and see what we can do, and I'll, be, I'll, I'll write back to him. Caroline. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend knows better than most that COVID has an unequal impact on the BAME community, on the elderly, on men, and indeed on the overweight. Can he please update the House on the steps being taken across government to empower people 
away from fat shaming and away from an over reliance on BMI, which we all know is an inaccurate measure for individual well being, and let us know what he's in, he is doing to enable people to take back control of their own well being. Uh, well, I, I thank my right honourable friend for the, for the extreme tact with which she expressed her, uh, her, her question. And uh, just, uh, but she makes a very important point because I'm afraid that uh, there are significant comorbidities associated. Uh, with, with COVID, and we do need as a country to address uh, obesity and the, the sad fact that we are, I'm afraid, Mr. Speaker, considerably fatter than most other European nations, apart from the, the Maltese, as far as I can tell. And uh, we will be announcing a strategy uh, to help, oh, no disrespect to, uh, to Malta, Mr. Speaker, that's what the statistics uh, told me. Uh, we will be bringing forward a strategy which I hope uh, will uh, conform uh, with uh, my right honourable friend's strictures. Clive Betts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I don't know whether the Prime Minister has had a chance yet to read the uh, report uh, commissioned by the Ministry of Housing, Community and Local Government into the standard of homes delivered under um, permitted development. That report found properties with no windows, that three quarters of the properties didn't meet the national space standards, and I quote from the report studio flats of just 16 square metres were found in a di- number of different PD schemes. To put it in context for the Prime Minister, 16 square metres is just about the size of the base of the ministerial limousine which he gets driven around in each day. Will the Prime Minister now change the rules and ensure that in future we never again allow properties to be built, slums to be built, where people are last to live in a space which is as small as his ministerial car? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I was proud when I was Mayor of London to change the London plan so as to ensure that we went for Parker Morris plus 10 uh, for our space standards and we will ensure that we not only build back better, uh, that we big build back more beautifully, but that we also give people the space they need to live and grow in the homes that we will build. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the Prime Minister takes a well-earned staycation, will my right hon. Friend mind if I suggest some holiday reading? How Innovation Works by Matt Ridley will give new ideas how we recover from COVID. The Happiness of Blonde People by my dear friend Elif Shafak, who writes about our stories of immigration and the fragility of belonging. And finally, as the MP for the 100 Acre Wood, it's never too early to read Winnie the Pooh to Wilfred. And as Pooh said, you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. Sage advice for children everywhere from Wildon. Well, well I, I think that's wonderful advice from my, my right honourable friend, which I will, I, will, I will take to heart. And uh, I, I look forward to, to joining her for a game of, uh, of, of poo sticks in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 100, 100 acre wood. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing, Mr. Speaker, if the party opposite abandoned the spirit of Eeyore that currently uh, <laughs> seems, to, seems to envelop them? Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tonight I will be supporting Luton Town FC, who are fighting for their life in the Championship, although businesses across Luton South are doing the same. If Luton needs to go back into lockdown, will the Government introduce targeted financial support so local people can afford to adhere to health guidance? Yes, indeed, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the, uh, the the local authorities in, in Luton. The people in Luton, obviously, are working very hard to ensure that uh, they contain the epidemic in uh, in Luton. As, as, as local authorities are doing uh, around the country, we are supporting them, as she knows, uh, with uh, 3.7 billion pounds uh, of investment, uh, as well as the 600 million pounds uh, in, for the infection fund, and uh, and, and further funds, uh, 300 million, to support local track and trace. But if, of course, if local communities do have to go back into lockdown, uh, we will take steps uh, to support them as well. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I am wholeheartedly in support of this Government's plans to level up our country and build, build, build. Many of my constituents are concerned, however, about a proposed housing development in Chorley Wood. Whilst it is important that we build more affordable homes, this cannot come at the expense of our beautiful countryside. Can the Prime Minister tell me how the Government will balance the obligations local authorities have to build housing under local plans 
with protection for the green belt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, Mr. Speaker, and I, th I thank my honourable friend very much for his question because it allows me to, to point out that there is massive opportunity to build uh, back better, to build back better on brownfield sites, and that is what we should prioritise, and that is certainly uh, what we will be telling our local authorities. Let's send to Scotland to the Deputy SNP leader, who is audio only. Kirsty Oswald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Parliament will return after the summer recess to what manufacturing group Make UK describe as a jobs bloodbath because the Chancellor is ending the furlough scheme. We can see the impact on jobs and livelihoods coming over the horizon because of that furlough cliff edge. Mr Speaker, a meal deal doesn't cut it. What will the Prime Minister do to support strategic sectors and prevent unemployment reaching 1980s levels? Well, well, Mr Speaker, what we are doing already is uh, she knows about the job uh, retention scheme, the, the, the bonus to employers to keep uh, furloughed workers on of £1,000. Uh, she knows about the £2 billion uh, Kickstarter fund uh, that we've instituted, uh, these pro the Eat Out Help Out programme, the, the VAT cut, many other things that we've done on top of the £160 billion we've invested in, uh, in incomes and in jobs and, and uh, livelihoods throughout this crisis. But of course, Mr Speaker, we will continue to do more and as the economic uh, ramifications of COVID uh, unfold. And of course, uh, we are preparing for that. And uh, we will make sure we can't, as, as the Chancellor has said, uh, we can't protect every job. We must be clear with the country. We can't protect every job. But no one will be left without hope. No one will be left without opportunity. And this country will bounce back stronger than ever before. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. St Moore's in my constituency was recently placed first in Witches' survey of the best coastal destinations in the UK. Falmouth, a coastal town, constantly punches above its weight with very little. Can my right honourable friend confirm if, that the government is looking at further financial measures as, to help the coastal towns that have been hardest hit uh, in their time of need? Yes, Prime uh, yes I indeed, indeed I can, Mr Speaker. I thank my honourable friend and I can tell her that uh, we're funding 178 projects throughout England through uh, the £180 million Coastal Communities Fund and Truro will receive at least £500,000 uh, from the Towns Fund this year to support the high street and local community. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As Chair of the all-new parliamentary group on coronavirus, we are leading a cross-party rapid inquiry to make sure that we've learned the lessons from the UK government's handling of this pandemic before a second wave. We've had over 900 submissions so far, including those from bereaved families, those from lo who have long COVID, and also professional bodies like the BMA and the NHS Confederation. We will be releasing recommendations as we go throughout recess. I simply ask, would the Prime Minister take these recommendations seriously with, see, with the view to acting on them when we come back in September. So I will be very happy to look at uh, whatever her committee produces. Order. I have a short statement to make about select committees. On Tuesday, the 24th of March, the House passed an order allowing for virtual participation in select committee meetings and giving chairs associated powers to make reports. I was given the power under the order to extend it, if necessary, on Monday, the 8th of June. I announced an extension until Thursday, the 17th of September. I can notify the House today that I am no further extending the order until Friday, the 30th of October. Order. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next, I am now suspending the House for three minutes. Order.